Before leaving for Beirut, I asked my friend Lucas if he knew of any crazy Jesus stories that we should consider capturing. And he told me about this girl that had a really intense story, but he wasn't sure whether she would talk to us. So great, thanks. So you have this crazy story, but you're not sure whether or not she's going to talk to you. And as it turns out, she was willing to talk to us. And in all my traveling um, around the world and capturing different Jesus stories, this is one of my favorites for how faith building it was for me, for how personal of a message Jesus gave me through it, and, um, and just what a, what a privilege and an honor, absolute honor, to be able to travel places like Beirut and meet people like Stephanie. Here in Lebanon, we use the word, I don't know the, the literal translation for it, but it's just like that disease. We don't say cancer, we say that disease. Whenever someone would say, I have that disease, it would mean cancer. Okay, they are that much afraid of even saying the word cancer, okay? And just me hearing this was more like, oh dear God, you know? Like, I just sat, sat down on the bench and it just hit me, and it hit me so hard. Like, I'm now 19 years old with cancer. To be 19, and she's the only daughter, uh, uh, the eldest and only daughter in her family. She has five younger brothers, but she is like her dad's prized possession in their family. Months later, she's gone through chemotherapy. Everything's working the way it's supposed to. The breast cancer seems to be taken care of. Her family members are beginning to congratulate her for beating that disease. And within a few, a very short time after seemingly having beaten cancer, the, the whole thing goes from bad to worse. And she realizes that she's beginning to feel like a lump or like pressure uh, uh, in the back, on the back of her head. And, and symptom, like weird feelings, weird sensations, weird symptoms. She goes back to the doctor. The doctor ends up diagnosing her with a brain tumor on her central nervous system. I was just having a shower. I was already bald because, because of chemotherapy. And I just felt a lump behind my ear. And I literally freaked out, you know? And I called my psychologist and I was like, I want to end this today and I'm committing suicide. And she's like, no, you cannot do this. You're strong and you've been through a lot and you just cannot give up now. And I'm like, this cannot be possible. I, I like, I'm not even done with chemotherapy, that now I'm just getting another type of cancer. And she's like, maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's just sort of glands or anything that came out of, of because of chemotherapy, because of the intoxications and everything. And I'm like, no, I have a feeling, just the way I had a feeling that I have breast cancer, I'm now having a feeling that this is a tumor, you know? At that time, I had the most pessimistic oncologist on the face of Earth. And he was like, that's not possible. And I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, literally that was what he said. He's like, if that's true, you're only gonna live for seven months. Maybe like a month later, I was like, the symptoms were starting to show. My oncologist was like, I say you just quit university, you quit work, you go sit at home and take care of yourself. And I'm like, and by taking care of myself, you mean to die in few months? That's not what I want. He's like, but that's, that's God's will. And I'm like, if I were to quit university the way you're saying, and just sit home, I'll be allowing death and not God, you know? And at some point I'm like, miracles do happen. And so he was like, you're dreaming too big. And that was the moment I'm like, no, you're thinking too small. And on that day, I, I called my psychologist and I'm, and I'm like, I want another oncologist. And she referred me to another one who's just, he's amazing, you know? He just made all the difference. So I first went to him and I took my file and he was like, this is a rare case, a very rare one. There's only 72 cases in the world, okay? But I, I choose to say that we don't have to lose hope in a way, and miracles do happen. And I'm like, that's what I want to listen to. Like, that's what I want to hear, you know? 
Stephanie's doctor gave her 0.028% odds of making it out of the surgery without a problem or, or basically being, being cured. So there's a 99.7% chance that she is going to die on the surgical table. But still, she felt like the risk was worth taking. Like the last time the surgery has, has been done was in 2001. Okay, it's been 13 years that no one has ever done, went through this surgery because it's just not guaranteed in a way, okay? So at that point, I just had two options. It's either I continue to live the four months of my life or I choose to go through the surgery and it's either I die under surgery or I'd live. And by live, it's not four months, you know? So that was a really hard time and a really tough decision I need to make in my life and it took me like two days and I just called him and I'm like I'm ready to prepare the papers. One of Stephanie's best friends uh, about a month before Stephanie's scheduled to, to fly to Los Angeles for her surgery ends up in this little tiny Christian bookstore in middle of nowhere Beirut she goes in there and just starts crying and like loses it and the 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 people who are working there at the bookstore surround her ask her what's going on she tells them about her friend stephanie's story and how she's so afraid of losing her friend and they pray for stephanie's friend right there and then they say hey it'd be awesome if you would bring your friend back we'd love to pray over her so the day before this is may 19th 2014 the day before that stephanie's supposed to fly to los angeles for this crazy procedure her friend is like stephanie's at home with her family and they're all hanging out having a great time the literally what is what is likely to be the final day of her life when i had the surgery to remove the second lump one of my friends that i know she she came to me and she's like I want you to come with me to a really special place. And I'm like, I only have this few hours, you know, those few hours I want to spend time with family, with my mom, with like, you know, and it was two days before it was my mom's birthday, you know? So I just felt like I, I want to be close to them. Maybe in those few last hours, maybe, you know? And she's like, I promise it won't take much time. It's just like maybe, half an hour and just then we just leave and then we're just walking and we stood here and she's like here's the place and just stirred like this and like here's the place and I'm like yeah I like what about it like it's all like crosses and Bibles and Jesus and like what am I what am I doing here you know so she's like when uh, when you did your surgery a month ago I came here and to get you a souvenir and I told them your story and they they wanted to meet with you so if you know you don't mind I'd like to introduce you to them and we're just debating this over the door and this bell there's that bell that was ringing okay and so he am that lady she just came to the door and was like may I help you ladies and my friend was like this this and that that is the girl I told you about I don't know what so we came in and he started a more like preaching maybe I don't know like she started talking about Jesus okay and she's like you would have to let him come into your heart and to accept him and then he will do whatever is best for you and I was like yes I accept that and she's like she just stared at me like maybe she didn't get this you know and then she explained it and I'm like yes yes I agree with this and she's like that was fast and I just thought about it at that moment like I only have maybe a few hours you know I need anything just for me like maybe this can save me in a way you know and then they started praying for me and then we said goodbye and they wanted to hear from me and they wanted they took my phone number and and then I went home so you and that night I felt something it wasn't really weird as much as it was I don't know I, I couldn't explain it in a way you know but I was numb 
and I just sat down and I started thinking and recalling every single thing, every single person, every single thing that has happened to me in life, everyone that I've met. My, my life was just passing in front of me, you know? And there was that point where it was the first time ever I feel that feeling, which was like, God, you're not someone to be, for us to be afraid of. You're someone for us to love. And then I just started crying and crying, and I have no idea why was I crying. But one thing I surely know, I wasn't really afraid on that night. Stephanie begins thinking that maybe God's not someone to be afraid of, but someone to love. Like maybe he's actually someone that cares for her. So she's having these like weird thoughts, and then simultaneously, She's feeling some weird sensations that, that she hadn't felt with chemo. She, she felt all kinds of crazy uh, pain and, and all kinds of heavy physical issues throughout the, the brain tumor. But now she was beginning to feel some other sensations and one of which she just felt tired and felt like she needed to go lay down. And so her family's like, hey, what's wrong? Like, you're, you're, this is our last night together. Like, you haven't slept in days. Like, what do you mean you, now you're tired? But she, they let her go to her room. She goes to her room and like two hours later, they're banging on the door, like try, w trying to wake her up because they're all nervous, concerned, like what happened? She hasn't slept like this in, in, in days. So what's going on? So they go in, they wake her up and immediately she wakes up and doesn't feel a single symptom, doesn't feel any of the feelings she once had felt. And the first thought that comes to her is, was this a miracle? But then like almost as quickly as that thought goes in, the practical side of her brain comes on and she's like, no, that's crazy and dismisses it. So she ends up hanging out with her family for a little bit and then like shockingly to her, ends up being able to sleep the whole night, wakes up rested the day before she's supposed to fly to Los Angeles, goes into the doctor's office where her doctor was going to perform a, a final test because this was such a crazy, rare, weird cancer. Stephanie had given them uh, an opportunity to study her cancer both as she was alive and then also after she presumably would die. So they end up doing this test and the doctor comes back and says, Stephanie, something's wrong with a computer or with a machine or something because before all your levels were erratic and all over the place, now all the levels in your body that, that previously showed uh, what this cancer was doing are all reading zeros. And I was just looking and all those lumps that I have got used to them on the screen are just not there. Like, there's nothing, you know? Like, my head is, is clean. And I start, I didn't know what, like, it's like, I want to laugh and cry and I don't know what to say, you know? Like how, like, is it true that I now can live? I can now do what anyone in life can do? You know, that's, that's not even possible in a way. And thing is, it cannot be that the first initial results were wrong because my first initial results because my dad was that much in denial, he chose to do those same results in three different hospitals. And the same exact results were in the three hospitals, you know? So for us now to do the results, the same exact checkups and, and, and tests, and to just have 0%, that was just like unbelievable. And so now I feel like everyone perceives my story the way they perceive things and the way they perceive maybe the relation with God, you know, that this is a miracle that is related to Islam, which is not the case, you know, which, which it cannot be, like it, do, it doesn't belong to Islam in any way. And for you, for me as a Muslim to come to uh, my Muslim friend, for example, and tell them, hey, Jesus cured me, that's not an option in a way, you know, like I, I cannot go and say that. But then there's that point in life where you realize that it's my life and I want to live it the way I want. And Jesus has cured me with God. He just, he knows the heart, you know, and he, he understands when someone truly means that I want you to come into my heart because 
when I, I said it, although I didn't really understand the meanings of it maybe, I didn't really like get the whole thing, but I just felt like, yes, yes, I, I want this, you know? I talked to Stephanie for two hours, like sitting there just trying to hold it together, telling myself, like, hold it together, hold it together, don't cry, don't cry, like, just like, look, if she can do this and she's doing it so well, then the least you can do is keep yourself together. So by the end, I just, I, could, I just like, I, it was, I was undone. I just felt like I just came apart and every part of me that wanted to try to keep this thing together was gone and I just wept uncontrollably. And the only thought that came to me was, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. I've got to decrease so He increases. And that's it. It's, there's really nothing else to say. Like, what else do I add? What other words can I come up with to tell you the way in which this story touched me? It, there, it's like, this is that awkward time when you're looking at a camera and you know you should stop because there's nothing else to say and you're awkward me and you just keep rambling. So, Chad, shut up.